Good morning and welcome to the live program. My name is Rachel Hugenberg. I am the host here and I'm super excited because this morning we have with us local wildlife enthusiast Channing Green and marine biology student at Texas A&M Galveston. She was a supervisor over the summer for TWRC and I'm super stoked to have her here in honor of World Wildlife Day, which is actually today. So Channing, if you would, please. Hello, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my PowerPoint. And pull up, okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Channing Green. Um, I, been very passionate about wildlife for a while now. I've always loved animals. And now today I'm going to talk to y'all about why it's important to be passionate about wildlife. Um, I'm gonna start with sort of the benefits and little general facts about healthy wildlife systems and whatnot. And then I'll start with like TWRC and other programs that are working to help upkeep a healthy wildlife since it's so important. So first I have mammals, um, generally people's favorite type of animal to think of. Um, someone's least favorite animal is usually possums though. And people often think that they're like giant rats and they're creepy. Um, here to tell you that you don't necessarily have to like the way they look, but ultimately they are a lot more beneficial for the environment than people tend to think. Um, their fur actually has a special protein in it that chemically attracts fleas to it, which most people might think that's weird that they have fleas, but they're actually a very clean type of animal. And they don't usually have fleas on them because they eat the fleas off of their bodies. So if you have healthy possum environments nearby, and say you're walking your dog and there's possums in that area sometimes, you're less likely to have fleas on your pets because of possums will take out flea populations. Possums along with raccoons, also eat dead carcasses, and they're a great overall cleanup crew for the environment, which is super important because otherwise we'd have um, lots of smelly wildlife around. Um, on the flip side, though, it's important to note that although some animals might look super cute, raccoons or foxes, um, actually raccoons, bats, skunks, and foxes all carry rabies. Now you notice that possums is not in that list because possums don't carry rabies. Um, they are much cleaner than those animals. Another animal to keep in mind though that should be avoided and appreciated from a distance are armadillos because they, although rarely, but sometimes do carry leprosy. They should still be respected though because they're the Texas state mammal. Um, other wildlife that's important are squirrels. You might think that, well, they're everywhere, how important can they really be? But ultimately one of the strategies for squirrels is to bury their nuts, to hide them from other squirrels. And in doing so, they often forget them. And that ends up being why a lot of trees get planted and it's a huge successful sort of pollination method. Um, rabbits are ancestral to the food web as well. They're a very successful breeding population usually. They breed pretty well and for that being a primary consumer so they eat grasses and ultimately provide a great base for other upper level predators that we might like to see sometimes um, beautiful owls or hawks that are usually pretty appreciated rely on healthy rabbit populations that and rabbits are very cute but they also keep invasive grasses in check so a lot of grasses and spreading um, plants can very easily become invasive to environments and outcompete native grasses. Well, rabbits eat pretty much any grass and they're great at keeping them in check. Deers do the same thing where they keep invasive plants in check, usually a bit higher off the ground though, with bushes and shrubs. Um, but deer are also great for bringing profit to Texas for hunting because of their populations and sometimes go too big because of how much plants we have. Um, and so that bringing the population hunting licenses raise um, 
money for other wildlife protection act agencies that I'll mention later. Next is birds. <laughs> um, some people's favorites, some people prefer mammals. Ultimately though, birds are super important for the environment for a variety of reasons. Um, a main thing people always like to hear is that they eat pesky bugs. There's quite a few insectivores in the avian kingdom that eat mosquitoes or crickets, and that can generally be annoying. Birds are also actually a huge revenue of tourism for wildlife. Um, bird watchers can be very obsessed when they want to look for very beautiful birds. Um, so while some look pretty, like the Rosetta Spoonbill I have below there, um, this is beautiful Galveston flamingo look, um, or some sound pretty, like the mockingbird I have pictured above that. Um, ultimately, people really appreciate finding birds that are beautiful and aesthetic, but they don't always, it's not just about aesthetic and bird watchers for why keeping them healthy is so important. Um, waterfowl birds, so ibises to ducks, that sort of herons, all of them are really important to keeping the wetland areas clean. They stir up marsh and aerate the soil to help plants grow. And you might be thinking, well, swamps are stinky and gross. Why would we want to keep them around? And that's because they act as a barrier between the land and the ocean. So any pollutants or anything that we terrestrial mammals tend to wash down our rivers, they go through this filter of wetlands first before going out to sea. If we didn't have wetlands, a lot of our fishing stocks and blue crab or shrimp that is out in the ocean that we rely on so heavily would ultimately crash because they wouldn't have either nursery grounds since a lot of small arthropods like shrimp and crab use wetlands for a nursery or we are there could be pollutants upper levels of the fish chain so any red snapper you plan on eating from the gulf could be filled with pollutants that we might not know about if we didn't have wetlands to protect us from those pollutants. Other benefits of birds include the duck stamp program, which is another thing where hunters pay to be able to hunt ducks. And usually that license will go towards the duck stamp program, which helps fund parks and wetland areas. Um, one such park is Anahuac, is funded mostly by the duck stamp program. Birds are very fragile though. Um, yes, they do long migrations, but ultimately there's a lot that can go wrong with bird populations. So if you've heard the phrase a canary in a coal mine, um, they're a great indicator species basically. If our bird populations start dying out and that becomes a problem, then we know well, something's bad right now. Like the environment is not acting the way it should be since our bird populations are plummeting. Um, one such example, maybe you've heard of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring book that was about sort of DDT in the environment, which actually caused a lot of different birds to have their eggs be too fragile and they ended up crushing whenever they sat on them. So um, the brown pelican is one where it was endangered actually in the 60s and 70s and their populations were very dangerously low, but is actually a recovery story because now if you've ever been to Galveston, you know that you can't go to Galveston without seeing at least one brown pelican somewhere because they're everywhere and they're extremely popular and are now of least concern actually on the endangered list. So um, below I have a link to the iNaturalist I'll talk more about iNaturalists, but all these links are going to be to guides for how to identify birds, and I'll have a few other ways to help identify birds if you're ever curious. So next I have reptiles. Um, people's often least favorite. They think they're slimy and gross. Um, snakes tend to be seen as dangerous, and people don't like them ever, but in reality a lot of Texas snakes are actually pretty harmless. There's another link to another iNaturalist guide so you can kind of see okay, what snakes are good, what snakes are bad. I probably don't have enough time to list all the snakes because there's lots of snakes, but um, 
You can look at that. Um, brown anoles versus green anoles. Now you'll probably know there's lots of little lizards everywhere. Maybe you see them. Maybe you only occasionally catch a glimpse of movement. But usually they come most commonly in green or brown. And you might be thinking, okay, they're just lizards. They both have the pretty throat thing. Why does it matter? Well, the brown ones are actually Bahamian anoles and the green ones are American anoles. Now you might be thinking, why is a lizard from the Bahamas in Texas? Um, and that's thanks to PetSmart and other pet stores because these anoles are actually seen as pets a lot of times. So a kid will be like, oh my gosh, I want the cute lizard with the long tail. And then they get the cute lizard with the long tail. And then they lose the cute lizard with the long tail because these lizards are very fast and they'll just scurry away. And then now we have invasive brown anoles out competing our beautiful green anoles. Um, so it's important to keep a healthy wildlife, otherwise you'll have brown lizards instead of green lizards. Um, another category of reptiles are red-eared sliders, which is a kind of native turtle to Texas. Um, probably, maybe if you've gone to any wetlands areas, you might have seen a turtle. Most commonly it's probably a red-eared slider. They are native to Texas, so that's great. However, they're invasive in other parts of the U.S., like California and Oregon. This can sometimes cause problems because, well, it's great in one area of the state, but not great in other areas of the states. Um, and people sometimes forget that like the U.S. is such a large geographic region. We have such a variety of wildlife, and people often don't realize how much there's differences between like, well, it can be really good in one area and then really bad in another area. And it's important to keep track of wherever you are. I'm mostly talking about Texas wildlife because that's where we are. But if you go somewhere else, sometimes it's different. Um, another often seen as scary animal is the American alligator. Um, just like the brown pelican and other varieties of birds, it was actually endangered in the 60s and 70s due to DDT. Um, same region, fragile eggs. They have very similar eggs to birds. And thanks to lots of rehabilitation programs and whatnot to help rebuild the population of alligators, it's actually a, su a success story now, and they are of least concern as well. Um, the picture I have of alligators is actually in a lab I'm working with on my campus, since I mentioned I'm a Galveston student, and we are currently studying how alligators react to higher salinities and whatnot. So those are the alligators that I regularly feed. Um, and they're very cute and I love them, but they're only like three feet long, so they're not really gonna hurt anyone. Okay, next up is bugs. Some beautiful, some not. Um, a lot of times when people think of butterflies, they'll think of the famous and extremely beautiful monarch butterfly. Um, other times you might think of a pollinator like bees. Um, so honeybees and monarch butterflies are both amazing pollinators. Without them, we wouldn't have good flower populations or good crop populations as well since they help pollinate crops. Um, and without them, we'd have to find a way to manually pollinate crops, which would be much more expensive than just keeping healthy wildlife of honeybees and butterflies. One way that the regular average citizen can actually help though is by considering a more, a garden with more native plants. Um, below is a list of several native to Texas plants that are great for butterfly gardens that are pro um, insects. Um, uh, I understand that that list is long and sometimes you don't necessarily know what they all are. So there's also a link to the wildflower.org site which has a lot of sites about different flowers that are good and bad for the backyard and what is well, how, how can you promote wildlife in your own little ecosystem. Um, another bug, um, arthropod, that people don't often like as much are spiders. Now, I understand that things like the wolf spider and the jumping spider have very <laughs> intimidating names, 
In reality, they're both very tiny and can't really do anything to you, though. And people often see a spider and think, oh my gosh, grab the newspaper, let's kill it. Um, which is actually not good because they also, like birds, do a great job of taking out worse insects we'd rather have less of. Gnats or, in, or mosquitoes, spiders will help us take them out. Or spiders, you know, they're in the middle of the food chain, kind of. And so they also are great for, um, they're a great food source and diet of many of the more beloved birds. So sometimes you just gotta deal with the gross eight-legged creature because you want the beautifully feathered one. And so it's sort of keeping in mind the balance it takes to have a healthy wildlife and healthy ecosystem. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some programs. We're going to start with TWRC and then work into a few more other programs that talk about wildlife. Um, I'm going to go most in depth on TWRC because that's where I used to work, so I know the most about it. And it's my favorite. Um, so TWRC stands for Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. Now you might be thinking, I thought it was rescue. What's rehabilitation? That's sort of the process of we're not just saving animals, we're making them better and available to the environment. So we want to put any injured animals back into our ecosystem to keep a healthy wildlife outside. Um, so TWRC takes in a lot of native animals. Now, sometimes it can be confusing. What's native, what's not native? Um, the answer is usually you're gonna have to, if you don't automatically know, it's a good idea to just call in at TWRC, but um, I have a long list of several animals, and because there's such a variety, um, it's mammals and songbirds, lots of birds, lots of mammals, a few reptiles, although they're not often as well loved by the public, so they don't come in as often. But they definitely do. TWC does accept almost all native animals. Um, there's a few animals, such as if you find some large endangered deer, TWRC might not be the best place to take it since we're not the biggest. But as you can see, there's a lot. Um, now, sort of the if almost more important side of that is what TWRC doesn't take in. We want to take in what's good for the environment and what, it, yeah, what's good for the environment. So pets, not so good. Um, although dogs and cats tend to be found in the parks and whatnot, sometimes feral to cats or stray dogs, that doesn't mean that they belong to the wildlife and are probably better suited for places like the SBCA or CAPS. Um, in fact, any, even though you might see and think that this weird leopard gecko looks like it could belong, um, it's actually more of a pet species, so it doesn't go to TWRC, even though you might not want it as a pet, someone's pet probably. Um, on the other side, there's non-native animals. So I was mentioning before about how some animals are invasive sometimes. Um, I have a short list of some of the most popular invasive animals that TWRC can't take in because they're not good for the environment, so we don't really want them there. Um, starlings are beautiful and all, but they don't belong here. The Eastern starlings are from Europe, actually, and they are currently outcompeting some of our beautiful native species. So maybe if you find an injured one, um, Unfortunately, TWC is not the place you could help save its life since TWC only takes in native animals. House sparrows can be really hard to tell the difference between house finches, so I'd suggest just calling and really describing the bird in depth. But before you take them in, because again, it's something that ultimately we just, we don't want starlings in our environment, so we can't support their population. Um, Another important aspect is healthy animals. Maybe I'm thinking, what's wrong with healthy animals? And the answer is nothing. That's why they should stay outside. Um, anytime you see a bird nest, 
before you just like, oh, let me just scoop up these babies and save them to ever see. Wait first and make sure that there's not some mom a bird off just getting insects and whatnot to feed her babies because we TRC does a good job of taking care of baby animals or injured animals, but if that animal is fine in the wildlife, you know, if mom is gonna do a better job than we are. So it's a good idea to keep the mother in her job of being a mom. Um or on the flip side, if you see an animal you think is injured, but perhaps that bird doesn't think he's injured. Um We've had people try to catch grackles from parking lots because they only have one leg type thing. Um, grackles are great at surviving. You might think one leg is a problem, but for a bird that mostly flies, one leg is not really that big of a problem. And if you see it's eating those spelt french fries just fine, odds are you can kind of keep it there because we want to focus on saving orphans and actually injured animals in our environment in our limited animal care program capacity so speaking of animal care programs um these are the major programs twc has it's the baby care baby bird program baby squirrel program and possum program and these require a lot of volunteers so the baby bird program is more in the summer it's sort of the baby squirrel is in the spring, then squirrels stop breeding for a bit, and birds start breeding, and that fluctuate, and then birds stop breeding, and then baby squirrels come out. And so baby squirrels spring and fall, and baby birds is mostly the summer. Um, and the possums are usually from March and November, because population um, possums have a long breeding season. They tend to just kind of breed year-round. And we need a lot of help with possums because um, actually mother possums, they give birth to large litters of up to 13 and they're not very good parents. They're great and very clean for the environment, but not good for their babies. If they're ever being like threatened or endangered, maybe there's a dog running after them, they tend to just drop their babies and run and not always come back. Um, so we do end up getting with a lot of baby possums, which is great and all, but with a lot of possums, they have really cute faces and everyone just wants to cuddle them, we end up needing a lot of help. I mean, the birds, for example. Those baby birds pictured below, um, so they're naked birds type little babies, they have to be fed every 15 minutes. Now you can imagine TWC is a nonprofit, so we have limited funding as is to hire supervisors to feed them every 15 minutes. So we need a lot of help to feed birds every 15 minutes. Um, currently, however, due to COVID, TWC does not have available volunteers. It's still on edge of whether or not we can safely have volunteers or not. So it's a bit waiting, but hopefully soon or perhaps in the future, next year, this volunteering will be available to help. Um, it does take a lot to raise wildlife in captivity. Um, we can't just cuddle them and because and we try to interact with them as little as possible because we don't want to raise some possum and then it end up loving people and want to walk up to every person it meets in the wild because not every person it meets is going to be a friendly person. So we don't want them to get themselves in danger when they don't need to be in danger. Um, so we try to make sure that they are still scared of people because that's how they're supposed to be. We do, however, give animals lots of daily enrichment. Small toys, treats, different scents and smells. And we try to keep their food and nutrients as similar to what they're supposed to get in the wildlife to stay completely healthy. Now you might be thinking, how hard can it really be? Let me tell you, trying to match possum formula milk, it's not the same as cow's milk. It's very difficult. Birds are a bit easier because they just eat seeds, but we also, the great part about having a large facility is keeping animals in age groups. So when we get a lot of possums to keep warm, they like to cuddle up when they're really young. 
but over time, so they start in bigger groups of six or so, and then we start to break up those groups into smaller and smaller groups, and so they're in cages kind of by themselves, usually because as possums grow older, they start to become more and more of loners. Birds go the opposite way. We try to keep them individuals by themselves when they're babies, so we can really keep a good eye on them and make sure everyone's getting fed enough food. Then, as they grow up, we try to put them in the same species, but in larger groups so that they can interact. Robins are the cutest when they're all cuddling together. And someone who wants to just rescue a bird by themselves, sometimes they don't get that opportunity to learn from other birds and interact with other birds, since flocks are such an important part of being a bird. Some mammals at TWRC ultimately can't be released, though. Our goal is to help the environment and help wildlife any way possible. Usually that means releasing animals back into the wildlife. In some cases, like the pictured owl, Iris was missing an eye. So she's not the best at hunting and can't be released. But that doesn't mean that Iris's life is now going to waste. She's an educational owl, and we want to teach people about the importance of owls and everything. And so by showing kids who might not be enthusiastic at first of a bunch of trees, well, hey, look, look at this cool owl, it's a pirate. Um, that's what gets people really excited. And it's the educational part. Now, obviously, I've talked a lot about TWRC because it's great, but it's not the only program out there. There are plenty of other, everyone wants to help the wildlife. So the, goal, the Gulf Coast Wildlife Rescue is probably the most similar to DBRC. Usually, though, they're a bit bigger. Um, there's a few other locations. They can sometimes take larger animals or more animals if TWRC starts to fill up. But like TWRC, they only take in native animals. So if you're ever considering where to go and which one's closer, they do about the same thing. Okay. Now you might be thinking, cats, SPCA, aren't those dogs and cats? Didn't we just say dogs and cats aren't native? Why would this help the environment? And it still does. Even though dogs and cats aren't native, um, these programs are great because they keep them off the streets. Feral cats tend to decimate city populations of animals. Um, all those birds, cats are eating them. So it's a good idea to pick up all the strays, keep them out of the woods and in homes. Um, that way then wildlife can grow and not worry about unnecessary predators that could technically be invasive, I guess. Um, so if you are not a huge fan of the wildlife necessarily, but you want to help the wildlife in your own indirect way, you can think of CAPS and SPCA as helping the wildlife indirectly. Um, by taking out the dogs and cats off the streets and into homes. Um, I believe SPCA right now is also one that cur or CAPS does not have volunteers yet because of COVID, but that doesn't mean they won't soon. They probably will. Um, perhaps another program you might have heard of, the Audubon Society. They mostly run parks great to walk around and really immerse in wildlife. Um, these parks are some of the most important places for wildlife as they provide homes or migration centers, etc. Um, they also, in a few areas like the Bolivar Peninsula or there's the Edith Moore Bird Sanctuary also has a camera. Um, they have cameras so that you can kind of look and watch wildlife even from your own home. Maybe you're trying to avoid going out Right now, um, you can, I've got a link to cameras that you can see and sort of watch birds and enjoy wildlife from a distance. Now, although Audubon Parks with their many, their website tends to have lots of links to articles and whatnot, and they're very visitor friendly, not all parks are quite as visitor friendly. The Texas Parks and Wildlife is mostly more on the side of catering towards the animals, less catering towards the people. Um, so their parks are sometimes larger, but you often can't always go
go to all of the park because animals sometimes don't want to be able to look at them. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife also manages fisheries and hunting licenses. So before I mentioned ANAWAC, Texas Parks and Wildlife is a part of that. Um, they're sort of the government enforcing side of this because you can't just tell people not to fish this endangered fish and expect people to do it without there being someone watching to smack a fine down. They have a lot of programs though. Um, it's very interesting how often their programs change. So I can't be a Marby marine biologist, Galveston student without mentioning marine mammals and turtles. Um, many of you heard about the turtles and whatnot that were had to be rescued during the winter storm and were have safely returned now, but also then they had to be protected. So same usually goes for marine mammals have to be protected. Um, if you ever are walking along the beach and you spot a beach turtle or a beach mammal um, dead or alive, even if this turtle is, you can tell it's not necessarily beached, it's just laying eggs on the beach, it's a good idea to call it in so that Noah can know what's going on because Noah does a lot of managing of where they are to protect these species because of how well loved they are. I mean, turtles and Mammals are, tend to be the poster child of Save the Oceans, even though they're not always the most populous. The whole charismatic megafauna. Well, it's cute, so we have to save it type of thing. Okay, now you're probably wondering, I have probably listed quite a few animals. How can you identify animals? And how do you know what's what? Um, well, there's a website. It's also an app. So it's both. If you're more of an app person than a website person, it's both. Um, and it's called iNaturalist. They are mostly focused on uploading photos. Now, this works great whenever those black-eyed Susans are just sitting still, not doing much, or that turtle is too slow to move anyways. Um, and so it's great to, and easy to catch a photo of them. And when you can upload a photo to it, it will help give suggestions based on your location and based on a few, if you take multiple angles of the image. Perhaps if you're identifying a plant, it's a good idea to do the flower and the leaves um, to get the whole plant in a few photos so that you can figure out what it is. Is it invasive? Is it not invasive? Because let's be real, there's a lot of animals out there. No one can expect you to just memorize everything. Um, iAntrus also has ways where you can communicate with other observers. Maybe there's a specific kind of bird or mammal that you've been dying to see and you can't find anywhere in Texas. If someone's posted a picture that they've identified it, you could go there and look for that in that same thing. It allows you to be a citizen scientist so that everyone can know what's going on everywhere in the wildlife. Um, and this is more of a global thing, though. iNaturalist is not limited to just Texas. It's everywhere. Okay. So another more identifying -y type thing is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So they run the website all about birds, which is great for information, but they also run two other apps, so apps and websites. So there's eBird and there's Merlin ID. So the Merlin bird ID is better for iNaturalists can identify birds, but usually you can't get a good photo of birds. They're a bit faster, usually farther away. Maybe you're looking through binoculars and you're trying to find a way to put your camera through the binoculars and it's just not working. Um, the Merlin ID is more based off of describing the bird. Maybe you'll do like a size comparison and then some colors and whatnot in your area. What's most common in the area? You'll scroll through some options. And that can help you identify birds which is important for the eBird app. Now the eBird app is more on the other side of the iNaturalist, the whole citizen science thing. So whenever, if you become a birder, maybe you like birds and whatnot, and you're avid into the environment, and you end up start seeing lots of birds. If you're going through parks and you see, oh, there's a bird, oh, there's another bird, oh, there's another bird. And you want to let people know, or maybe you just want to keep track of your own checklist of how many species of birds can you see. eBird is more of a checklist. So you start a checklist, you can um, 
count however many birds you've seen. It has a sort of timer. It keeps track of your location of where you are. If you're doing it on your phone versus if you're on the computer, you have to type in your location and whatnot. And that helps for identifying where birds are because scientists like to know, okay, what's endangered? What's not endangered? How many are people seeing green winged teals everywhere? Yes. Yes, we are seeing these ducks everywhere. Or maybe not as common stuff. The sandhill crane. It's a huge four-foot bird. How could you miss it? Well, it was endangered. And it is starting to incline, but slowly. Um, where are they going now? How can we rescue this bird? Oh, people keep seeing them at this area. We should protect this area. Um, that kind of stuff. Okay. So now we're getting more into the part of what you can do to help, because let's be real, it takes a lot to manage the wildlife and really support that ecosystem. Um, and so there's a lot you can do. There's little things, just buying a bird feeder, buying a birdhouse so that you can have a bird friendly backyard. That helps. Participating in little bird counts. That helps. Just not letting your cat outside. Maybe your cat can become an indoor cat. Maybe you can attach a bell on it so it's not the best hunter. Helps the environment. Volunteering. Um, not as often. Not right now, it's COVID has kind of limited volunteering. But in the future, volunteering is such an important way to help. Because maybe you're not interested in buying a bird feeder. You're more interested in doing the time. That works too. Um... Other time-consuming activities such as cleaning up. A lot of parks sometimes have a lot of trash, and just doing participating in cleanup, like trash pickup um, events, or even tree planting events. That's more donating your time. Maybe you have a different budget for helping the wildlife. You can also help wildlife actually by humanely managing unwanted visitors. Possums are great and all, but it's understandable you don't want them in your house or in your attic. Like, I mean, it's your attic. No one really wants them there. Um, and that's understandable. But that doesn't mean that possum has to die for its crime. It can um, be captured in a safe way and then relocated to a better environment. Um, and then that possum gets to live longer and rid the world of fleas a bit longer. Um, other more general ways to help the environment are the usual reduce, reuse, recycle, and being environmentally aware. Maybe not eating as much beef because you want to save water. Um, more extreme ways to help the environment that are a bit more, wow, I'm really into this, I want to help a lot, is becoming a rehabber. Um, TWC had a live species they took in. But if you notice, I only mentioned three programs. And the baby bird program is mostly just songbirds, not necessarily owls and doves. But we have rehabbers who, it's sort of like fostering animals, where they specialize in a specific animal. So there's someone who could specialize in doves, where they take all the white wings, all the morning doves, all the rock doves, aka pigeons. Um, and raise them up. So doves are a bit different because of their crops are a bit lower and they require a different seed diet. They require grit because that helps them chew their seeds. And sometimes TWC can't manage that sort of different volunteering things and it's a lot smaller. Um, TWC volunteers can't handle raccoons because they have rabies. But we have a rehabber who has a rabies shot and is prepared to handle lots of really cute baby raccoons. And that is a more larger impacting way. Although, ultimately, maybe you don't want to sacrifice your life to feeding birds. Um, another way is to donate. Um, this doesn't have to be money. There's TWC, um, Gulf Coast. Lots of sites have a wish list. Where there could be a specific kind of bird seed or cat food that they want. Or even blankets. TWC is always taking in newspaper. Those bo those Baby possums are really cute and all, but they love shredding and building nests in newspaper. And then peeing in those nests. And then volunteers have to clean them up. And so we need lots more newspaper to build them new nests. And 
So newspaper is something you're probably just going to recycle anyways. So why not just donate it to the or sea to help save some wildlife and get them more comfortable in their environments? Okay, I know that was a lot. So were there any questions about anything? Um, most of that was terrestrial. I have a degree, I'm working on my degree in brain biology, so I can answer ocean questions too, though. Okay, so what I'm going to do is ask that if you have questions or comments, can you put them in the chat and then I will refer them to Channing. There's lots of love for possums and squirrels and some sadness on behalf of not seeing as many green anoles. Efforts to TNR cats. And some tips about if you take care of outdoor cats, keep them well fed and put bell collars on them. Um, what do you recommend, say, for folks who live in apartment complex or suburbs? Is there are there things that we can do to assist? So that can usually be more volunteering based. Um, maybe you've got a park in your area to help with, or and it's mostly time donation type stuff. Um, some apartment complexes actually have dog parks and whatnot. Maybe you can set, find a way to set aside a certain area of your part of your apartment complex to maybe start a butterfly garden or something that other uh, apartment complex residences would appreciate. All right, and from Regina, we have the question, do possums rely more on their sense of smell than their eyes? Um, it's kind of a mix of both. Usually it's more smell than eyesight, but um, because especially during the day, it's much more smell since they have very bad daylight eyesight. Um, at night, their eyesight is not as bad as some people think they have bad eyesight, but it is more smell than eyesight. I know that my... Uh... My partner's father is a birder. Are there specific birding spots here in Texas that are really good for people to watch for certain species? Um, so sometimes it can be really hard to identify small songbirds. So I actually prefer the wetland birds like ibises and there's lots of different herons and whatnot. And those areas are really popular. Actually, Galveston is great for that. There's like the National Park in Galveston. Um, and those types of parks, usually you see a lot of different birds and wildlife, actually different seasonally. So um, I mentioned sandhill cranes, they're in Galveston right now, but in the summer they're going to go, usually around Corpus is when they're going to be. And so it's sort of, so April is like the best time to find birds in March. This is this is the peak birding season time to go to Galveston and just look for birds. Um, Featherfest is going to happen soon, which is run by the Artist Boat Association, um, where everyone gets to talk about all the birds they're seeing in Galveston. But in Houston, it can be a bit tougher because ultimately you just have to find an area. Memorial Park is great for people, not so great for animals, so it can be harder to see birds there. Do you happen to have a personal favorite type of wildlife to work with? Um, so I'm a bit biased right now because I'm currently in a coastal ornithology class, but I really like birds now. Um, I used to want to study more deep sea wildlife like cephalopods, and then I realized how difficult it is to and expensive scuba diving is. And I was like, oh look, birds are on land. They're so easy to see. Um, I've actually grown to love birds. Um, when I worked as a TWRC person over the summers, I was one of the only supervisors who preferred birds over possums. So I've actually grown to really like birds, mostly. Okay, do we have further questions? You can either put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and just jump on into the conversation. Um, really interesting to learn more about text life not being from here is to identify a few things that I'm seeing around here so and we've got some excitement about the apps that you mentioned yeah the the iWildlife looks really interesting 
and so do the ones about birds. Um, are there any apps for recognizing local reptile populations? So with the reptile populations, it's mostly just iNaturalist. Um, there's not necessarily labs. Okay, so, so the Merlin ID app is run by like a specific lab. But um, and there's not as much research going on for the public being excited about reptiles since they're not quite as popular ultimately. So um, the iNaturalist app does have great, if you can get a good photo of your wild, your lizards or turtles, that can be good, but it's usually, I don't have a specific app for them. Do you happen to have a favorite animal cam that you like to watch? I know right now with quarantine, animal cams have uh, jumped in popularity rates. I have really liked watching the more bird sanctuary camera, um, partially because so I used to grow up. I mean, the house I grew up in was like right down the street from that park, so it's really nice to sometimes go on that app and see. I mean, it's um, or go on that website and look through the camera and notice all these birds that because you've got this cabin in the background that I remember I took a camp as a little kid and I used to walk around hop the fence of my backyard, walk down the creek, and go to that park. Um, so currently that's kind of my favorite. Yeah, there's a comment from Regina saying that they have really great squirrel action there. <laughs> yes. Squirrels are very good at utilizing bird feeders. Are there other things that we can do to research and help and assist the wildlife here in terms of, you know, I know with quarantine, a lot of us can't volunteer, but are there extra other things that we can do? Um, so it kind of depends on how in depth you want to get. Um, one other additional part of that iNaturalist site is that you, there's certain, they have, um, parks or wildlife that you can kind of rally around is sort of like, oh, this is a favored species. And sort of just talking about and showing interest in a species can help alert the world that this species exists and it should be saved. Um, increasing popularity of wildlife in general. Like maybe you're gonna, instead of posting that cute photo of your cat on your Facebook, you're gonna post some cute bird you see. Um, and sort of making people aware actually really helps. Do you have favorite films or books that you would recommend for getting to know more about wildlife? Oh, let's see. Um, it's a bit different because of, now that I think about it, most of my books are a bit more ocean-ish, less um, wildlife in general. Uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. Um, Ah, we're being asked, are there programs for saving wildlife impacted by real estate development? So most of those are just kind of like the same programs. Um, TWC and Gulf Coast tend to help with those. Um, there are a few, well, there's some legislative action that is whenever some wetland acreage it gets developed on, then there's a lot of programs that want to create new wetland acreage in that is sustainable. It's not just like a puddle. It's actually something that could support life type wildlife. And um, you'd have to, it depends on, it's very like specifically location based and it changes depending on sort of what programs have money and whatnot as far as how to help with that though. So I don't have any things specific right now. Okay, well, we were really excited to have you in this morning for World Wildlife Day. I feel like I've learned a lot of different resources that we can access information about wildlife and also a lot about native Texas wildlife and how we can contribute to helping make a better opportunity and a better environment for local wildlife. And I really appreciate you joining us to help celebrate World Wildlife Day and bring some awareness to what's going on with the Texas 
wildlife environment. A lot of people are saying, I learned so much. Thank you. <laughs> and we really appreciate you coming out to talk with us, Channing. It's been a wild experience here at Life. Sorry, I inherited the puns from Claire Gunnels, my predecessor. I can't remember his life pun. <laughs> okay, so I know it's terrible, my love for puns, but while I love my cats and my domestic animals, I definitely want to do more for the environment and for local wildlife as well. So hopefully we will all have further opportunities to better Texas wildlife opportunities. And next week at LIFE, we are going to have in with us to discuss Ida B. Wells, journalist, educator, and suffragist. We are going to the park rangers, Susan M. Philpot of the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument in honor of Women's History Month. So, you know, there's been a lot of ladies represented this month, and we are going to be discussing Ida B. Wells next week. So do please join us. We're on at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, and we also have our YouTube channel, just in case you want to rewatch this presentation or catch up with past presentations as well. And we will have a list of resources and things that Channing discussed this morning going out, <coughs> going out to everybody. So thank you so much for joining us. And we really appreciate having you here on live Channing. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we will see you all next week. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. It was awesome. <laughs>